Zach Smith joins me now, who's a legal fellow with the Heritage Foundation. Zach, welcome to the program. And what in the world can we do to stop the riots and the violence that are going on in American cities? Hey, Lars. Well, thank you so much for having me on. And most importantly, I think we can allow police officers to do their jobs. Rather than demonizing the police, rather than handcuffing the police, preventing them from performing their vital functions of protecting people and property and communities, police officers need to be given the resources to do their jobs properly, and then prosecutors need to do their jobs as well and prosecute these crimes that are being committed. Well, Zach, I I don't disagree with any of what you said. The problem is police departments are under political control. They answer to a mayor or a city council or both, or in some cases to a city manager. Uh, Prosecutors in many places are elected, but we don't have time to wait for the next election two or three or four years from now to say this prosecutor is refusing to do it. This is a real-time decision kind of situation now where city pro- prosecutors in various jurisdictions are saying, we're not going to prosecute the rioters. And mayors and city councils are telling the police, don't do your job. What's the remedy there? Well, I think we've, we've seen some of the remedy is that when Local officials are not performing their functions to the extent federal officials can step in and prosecute these rioters for federal crimes. That's really the only effective way to push back against the chaos that's being created in so many cases. And so what we're seeing now in Portland, where there's been, you know, three straight months of unrest, essentially, is that the FBI in Portland is now starting to Uh, allocate more resources to going after individuals who have committed federal offenses. And in that case, uh, it's really proving to hopefully uh, kind of stem this tide of ongoing violence to some extent. And and to some extent, you know that my home studios are in Portland, Oregon, uh, and their right. two blocks uh, are normal studios. I'm working from home, have been because of the China virus for six months. But but the fact is, is that there's a there's a good situation there because Portland sits next to a state border. So if the, the FBI can say if you cross the state border intending to commit a crime, that gives federal jurisdiction. Other than that, or crimes on federal or against federal property, like a courthouse or a, a post office or one of those. But what about for the cities that, that, are, that are having this kind of problem that are not sitting next to a border and where there isn't an easy federal crime that can be alleged? Well, you know, Lars, unfortunately, with the responsibility that we get to choose our elected officials, unfortunately, you get the bad with the good. And what we're seeing now in a lot of places that have chosen to elect these rogue prosecutors who will not prosecute crimes, who have chosen to elect uh, mayors and city council members who want to defund the police, handcuff the police, keep them from, from performing their duties, is that in a lot of ways, they're really reaping what they've sowed now in that you're seeing a lot of violence, you're seeing a lot of unrest, and unfortunately, you're seeing loss of life and greatly increased amounts of property crimes being committed as well. And so I know it is unfortunate that, you know, folks are now having to live through this and endure it. But in a lot of ways, it is the responsibility of us as citizens to elect good leaders who are going to perform the essential functions of their jobs. Now, Zach, you're the lawyer. I'm not. But let me try a legal stretch and just forgive me for not having gone to law school and not knowing this. <laughs> but but I've always considered as a lay person that the original civil right is the right to be alive. And right behind that is to be alive and unharmed, not in the hospital recovering from wounds the way so many cops are and so many civilians are because they've encountered these rioters. Is there a civil rights case to be made so that even if the rioters aren't attacking a federal courthouse or a post office, but if they're if they're interfering with the civil right to be alive and to be safe and to be able to go to a town near where you live, is there a civil rights case there? Because we've certainly seen other civil rights cases made on far less serious matters than whether or not you're alive and not in the hospital. Well, Lars, you don't have to be a lawyer or go to law school to know that it's the first duty of the government to protect the safety and security of their citizens. And we're not seeing that in a lot of places right now. And so while it might be tough to make a civil rights case, depending on the specific facts, you know, the the facts on the ground in each jurisdiction are unique and different in their own ways. But it points to part of a, a larger troubling trend. You know, in Virginia, Uh, Just this past week, the Virginia Senate passed a bill 
that would lower from a felony to a misdemeanor. It can be charged as a misdemeanor now, assault on a police officer. And whereas before there was a mandatory uh, at least six months of incarceration for assaulting a law enforcement officer yep. under this proposed bill in the Virginia Senate, uh, jail time would no longer be required. And so I think what we're seeing here is a larger push, again, to really uh, prohibit the police from being able to effectively and safely do their jobs. Yeah, and, and that's the concern I've got, because it just seems a little bizarre, again, from outside of the law school uh, you know, environment, to say, if somebody says you can't stay in a hotel or you, your kids can't go to this school because of their skin color, the federal government can say that's a civil rights violation and we'll go right. after it. But, but if somebody is threatening to actually kill people in your town simply because you live in the town and because they've decided to have a riot and put a great many people's life or lives or safety at risk, no, there's no civil rights case there. It just seems not not that I don't take the denial of services to people based on any of the protected classes, you know, race, religion, national origin, physical disability. But the federal government goes to court all the time for for uh, TROs and injunctions and such to go after people who are denying, you know, in, in the great scheme of things, if a hotel says you can't stay here because you're disabled uh, and the federal government would go to bad for you. But if they say, but if you walk through your downtown and you happen to get clocked in the head with a brick, uh, that's that's not a civil rights case. It seems a little tough to take that, Zach. Well, I think what the federal government can undoubtedly do, Lars, is basically cut off the spigot of money to these state and local leaders who are refusing to cooperate with federal authorities, who are refusing to enforce the laws uh, that are on the books to protect their citizens. Each year, the Department of Justice gives uh, uh, many, many dollars uh, to state and local leaders uh, for law enforcement purposes. And if state and local leader, leaders are not going to cooperate with federal authorities, if they're not going to enforce the laws on the books, then they certainly uh, should not receive uh, the money that the federal government has been giving to them to do just that. And so to the extent Congress needs to get involved, Congress should certainly do that. And to the extent the Department of Justice can itself reallocate that money, that's certainly something that the attorney general and the folks at DOJ should consider doing. Zach, thank you very, very much. I appreciate what you do at Heritage, and we always appreciate your time.